Welcome to Books and Music Review, and today we'll be discussing a fascinating subject and very topical, the conflict between Israel and the Palestinians. It's often called the Arab-Israeli conflict, but as you'll see, I think a better, better description would be the conflict between Islam and Jews or Islam and non-Muslims, in this particular case, the Jewish state. And the focal point of the show will be an examination of a, a fantastic new book by Robert Spencer. You may, may recall we reviewed a previous book entitled The, um, the History of Jihad from, from Mohammed to ISIS. And this is of the same theme, but it burrows down into a specific aspect of this global conflict that's been ongoing for the past 13 centuries or so. So the title of the book, book is The Palestinian Delusion, uh, and the subtitle is The Catastrophic History of the Middle East Peace Process. And as you can see from the, from the cover, it's a scimitar with a map of Israel and the Palestinian territories outlined, cutting into um, cutting into a white surface with blood flowing out, and this is this is sort of a visual metaphor for what we see happening in Israel and what's been happening in Israel, particularly after their declaration of independence and the ensuing Arab-Israeli conflict in the at the turn of the 1940s. And it's really pertinent because this comes on, on the hues of the Trump-Kushner peace plan and the ensuing uh, attack on this plan by not only Mahmoud Abbas and the Palestinian Authority, but the rulers of Gaza, Hamas, the organization of Islam, uh, the OIC, the Organization uh, of Islamic uh, Conference, and the Arab League have already in the past couple of days rejected the plan outright, and the Palestinians rejected the plan without examination. And this goes to the heart of one of Robert Spencer's key points, the idea that Palestinians, um, insofar as there can be a distinct group of Palestinian Arabs, and that's that's something we'll address a little bit later, but Palestinians and Muslims in general in this region have no real interest in pursuing peace. And he points out that there have been multiple opportunities, beginning with the original partition plan in 1947, when the British were seeking a way to extricate themselves from this morass in the wake of the First World War. You had you had Arabs, Arab Muslims continually revolting despite the fact that, he, that the British sought to placate them. And this, this is one of the things that, that um, Robert Spencer focuses on, the, f the, fact that, the fact that the British tried desperately to, to uh, dissemble and connive a way out of the... the out of the problem here, promising a Jewish homeland uh, with the Balfour de declaration, declaration. And Lord Balfour was a very, um, very adamantly uh, Zionist member of the British government, and he was one of the one of the people that had the perspicacity and the foresight to envision a land, a flourishing Jewish state when the Jewish diaspora returned in the late 19th century and the early 20th century returned and actually cultivated a land that would thrive. So you had that, that undercurrent, which was minority sentiment, but the majority of the British wanted to find a way to placate the Arab Muslims. And you see this, um, you see this repeatedly particularly with their relationship with Faisal al-Husseini, 
who was who was the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem, and he was placed there by the British themselves. In fact, their 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 envoy Herbert Samuel, and they cultivated this relationship despite the fact that Faisal al Husseini repeatedly revolted against the British, undermined their efforts, and encouraged pogroms against Jews living in Israel. So, um, let me just quote a little bit, which, which illustrates the, the problem with this approach. Uh, and, and this is from, this is from chapter, uh, this, is from, this is actually from the first chapter. Uh, and it says, the British, in order to allow for this violence to take place more easily, withdrew their own troops as well as the Jewish police from Jerusalem. Thus encouraged, al Husseini instigated riots in Jerusalem during Passover in 1920. His men told crowds in Jerusalem that the government is with us. Amid mass, and, and this, is, this is actually a, this was actually a justifiable statement because the British were backing him at this point. Amid mass looting and rapes, six Jews were murdered and over 200 more injured. A court of in inquiry found that the Jews were victims of a, of a peculiarly brutal and cowardly attack, the majority of the casualties being old men, women, and children. Then the British authorities, showing why their nation is sometimes call called perfidious Albion, arrested the man they had encouraged to mount one of these riots, al Husseini, but he escaped. Undaunted, the British tried him in absentia and sentenced him to 10 years in prison. This ha was, however, just for show. On April 11, 1921, the British High Commissioner Herbert Samuel met with al Husseini and rewarded him with the title Grand Mufti of Jerusalem, saying that he had hoped that this would pacify him to the extent that the influence, influences of his family and himself would be devoted to tranquility. It didn't work. al Husseini continued to instigate riots, just weeks after he became Mufti, he orchestrated riots in Petak Tikva and Jaffa in which 43 Jews were murdered. A British government report admitted that the Arab majority, who were generally the aggressors, inflicted most of the casualties. And it continues, The Shah Commission found that the riots were entirely the fault of the Muslim Arabs and blamed the Jews. It determined that the outbreak in Jerusalem on August 23rd was from the beginning an attack by Arabs on Jews for which no excuse in the form of earlier murders by Jews had been established and that these can, in our view, be no doubt that racial animosity on the part of the Arabs led to the attacks. However, it attributed this animosity to the disappointment of their national political aspirations and fear for their economic future. And this is a recurring theme. This is a recurring theme throughout throughout the history of Britain's, uh, Britain's management of the Palestine mandate, their rule over what, what would eventually become Israel, they were playing both sides uh, and usually putting their thumb on the scale favoring the Arab Muslims who were trying to persecute and relentlessly exterminate the Jews. And this was in spite of <clears throat> in spite of the fact, excuse me, in spite of the fact that the Jew, that th there was no Arab presence in Israel, and this was another, this is another myth that Robert Spencer debunks. The idea that there was a continual presence of quote unquote Palestinians, and by this meaning um, Arab Muslims, that there was a continuous presence in Israel from time immemorial. This is something that Palestinian propagandists, that uh, non-governmental organizations like UNRWA and supporters of the Palestinians continually emphasize, and it's simply a myth. There was no permanent presence. You had sporadic uh, bands of nomads, roaming Bedouins that inhabited this area, uh, a, a handful, a few thousand, and these were people who were descended from, from those who invaded Israel during the Arab conquest when Muhammad's successors as, as, as caliph uh, sent a force to invade and conquer Jerusalem and the Levant. The, these are their descendants. The Palestinians are not, there's no proof that these people are actually descended from the biblical Philistines. 
most if you look at the genetic ancestry of all of the Arabs that now live within Israel or in Gaza and the West Bank, these are people who came from Libya, from uh, Jordan, from Syria. In fact, up until the creation of the Palestinian Liberation Organization, Palestinians considered themselves either Syrian or Jordanian, or in some cases Egyptian. And this is why they did not protest the fact that Egypt had control of the Gaza Strip up until the Six Day War, and that Jordan had control of the quote unquote West Bank up until its capture by uh, um, it, 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 its capture and reintegration into Israel after 1967. So the Palestinians are relying upon this synthetic fabricated um, link to the land. And Robert Spencer, Spencer go, goes a long way toward demolishing, demolishing this idea. And this is one of the most interesting aspects of this book, the hardcore documentation of a lack of a Palestinian nation and as most of you know, Palestine itself was a word created by the Romans in order to, in order to destroy the Jewish lineage and the Jewish heritage within this region. It was called Syria Palestina, and this was created after the Romans had destroyed and dispersed the Jewish people within Israel. So, in um, this is the, in the first chapter. Uh, Robert Spencer goes into this in a little bit more detail, and he describes people who traveled to Israel during the 19th century, right before the first aliyah, or return to Israel of Jews who were scattered in the di diaspora, right before this began. So, uh, it says it, 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 in page 8, still another traveling English English clergyman, Henry Burgess Whitaker Churton, saw the desolation of Judea as the fulfillment of biblical prophecy. And here he's referring to the pro prophecy in the book of Deuteronomy, which explains how Israel will be cursed if they reject God and they reject his law, and conversely, how they will be blessed and eventually will return to the land which God had promised them. So it says in 1852, he published Thoughts on the Land of the Morning, a record of two visits to Palestine. Soon after leaving the Mount of Olive, Olives, Churton recounted, the country becomes an entire desolation for 18 miles of mountain until we reach the plain of the Jordan. It is foretold, and here he's uh, in parentheses, it says Ezekiel uh, 6.14, and is remarkably fulfilled that Judea should be more desolate than the desert ex itself. That plain, uh, the pl that plain itself is now in great measure bare as a desert. And this is what Israel looked like prior to the ingathering of the Jews and the recreation of Israel as a modern state. In the following year, one of Churton's fellow clergymen, the Reverend Arthur G. H. Hollingsworth, published his own treatise, uh, Remarks upon the present condition and future prospect of the Jews in Palestine. Uh, according to Hollingsworth, the Arabs had no special affection for the land and it was the Turks who claimed it and it was part of the Ottoman Empire at this point. The population of Palestine is composed of Arabs who roam about the plains or lurk in the mountain fastnesses as robbers and strangers having no settled home and without any fixed attachment to the land. Hollingsworth found the Christians of the area to be little better off in many of the ruined cities and villages, there exists also a limited number of Christian families. Um, poor and without influence, they tremblingly hold their miserable possessions from year to year without security and without wealth in a land which they confess is not their own. The Turks monopolize for themselves the spoils and power of conquerors. They claim the land that they le le levy the uncertain and unoppressive taxes. And here, Robert Spencer continues, even the Ottoman government, however, was not at home there. No Christian is secure against insult, robbery, and ruin. The Ottoman government is weak and violent, rapacious and uncertain in its justice, tyrannical and capricious. Their soldiery and merchants amount to a few thousands in a country where millions were formerly happy and prosperous. The influence of such a government never extends beyond the shadow of their standards. 
They are always in the attitude of a hostile army, encamped in a land which is only held by forcible possession, like a garrison under arms. They retain the country by the law of the sword and not by inheritance. And this is the key, the fact that the Ottomans were usurpers. They inherited the land that the Arabs themselves had conquered by force. Uh, there was no, despite the fact that Muslims claim, claim that Jerusalem had a mosque in it and they they, th th this is uh, the central claim of Muhammad's purported night journey, al-Isra, uh, or Hiraj. The fact that Muhammad journeyed from one of the, the oldest mosques, uh, that itself is a lie because there were no mosques, uh, Islamic mosques, in Arabia before Muhammad. To another w w one of the uh, oldest mosques in Jerusalem. The fact is, Muhammad simply patterned some of his original uh, religious beliefs after the Jews, and in fact, they would originally worship towards Jerusalem and not Mecca. But, um, but this is something Muslims believe: the fact that Jeru Jerusalem always had a Muslim presence, or that there was some connection. But the truth is, the Arabs conquered it by force and. War did not exist in this, this land until the 7th century, uh, many millennia after the Jews had already uh, lived and been given possession of this land and been exiled. Um, and this is, this is a key point made by Spencer. Hollingsworth, like so many others, bore witness to the land's steady depopulation. The Arab and Christian populations diminish every year. Poverty, distress, insecurity, robbery, and disease continue to, the weaken, to weaken the inhabitants of this fine country. He did notice, however, one group that was increasing in number. Amongst the scattered and feeble population of this once happy country is found, however, an increasing number of poor Jews. Some of their most learned men reside in the holy cities of Jerusalem. Hebron and Tiberias. Their synagogues are still in existence. Jews frequently arrive in Palestine from every nation in Europe and remain there for many years, and others die with the satisfaction of mingling their remains with their forefathers' dust, which fills every valley and is found in every cave. And um, one, of the, one of the other uh, chronicles that, 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 that Spencer lists is, of course, the most famous, which is that written by Mark Twain. Now, Mark Twain wasn't a believer in the sense of um, he wasn't a believer and in God, but he did have a very keen historical eye. And the way he describes Israel is very similar to the way it was described in Deuteronomy, what it would become at, after it was cursed. So uh, Spencer says here, the most celebrated chronicler of Palestine's pre-Zionist desolation was Mark Twain, who wrote about his travels in the Holy Land in Innocence Abroad in 1869. It is Twain's literary genius that gives us the most indelible images of the wasteland that was Palestine. And here he quotes Twain, Palestine sits in sackcloth and ashes. Over it broods the spell of a curse that was withered, has withered its fields and fettered its energies. Where Sodom and Gomorrah reared their domes and towers, that solemn sea now floods the plain in whose bitter waters no living thing exists, over whose waveless surface the blistering air hangs motionless and dead, about whose borders nothing grows but weeds, the scattering tufts of cane, and that treacherous fruit that promises refreshment to parching lips, but turns to ashes at the touch. Nazareth is forlorn about that fort of Jordan where the hosts of Israel enter the promised land with songs of rejoicing. One finds only a squalid camp of fantastic Bedouins of the desert. Jericho the accursed lies in a moldering ruin today, even as Joshua's miracle left it more than 3,000 years ago. Bethlehem and Bethany, in their poverty and their humiliation, have nothing about them now to remind one that they once knew the high honor of the Savior's presence. The hallowed spot where the shepherds watched their flocks by night and where the angels sang peace on earth, goodwill to men, is untenanted by any living creature and unblessed by any feature that is pleasant to the eye. Renowned Jerusalem itself, the stateless name in history, has lost all its ancient grandeur and has become a pauper village. The riches of Solomon are no longer there to compel the admiration of visiting Oriental queens. The wonderful temple which was the pride and glory of Israel is gone, and the Ottoman crescent, crescent is lifted above the spot where, on that most memorable day in the annals of the world, they retired the Holy Cross. 
The noted Sea of Galilee, where Roman fleets once rode at anchor and the disciples of the Savior sailed in their ships, was long ago deserted by the de devotees of war and commerce, and its borders are a silent wilderness. Capernaum is a shapeless ruin. Magdala is the home of beggared Arabs. Bethsaida and Chorazin have vanished from the earth, and the desert places round about them where thousands of men once listened to the Savior's voice and ate the miraculous bread sleep in the hush of a solitude that is inhabited only by birds of prey and skulking foxes. Palestine is desolate and unlovely, and why should it be otherwise? Can the curse of the deity beautify a land? Palestine is no more of this workday world. It is sacred to poetry and tradition. It is dreamland. And Spencer goes on to quote him even more from this remarkable book. And it attests to the fact that despite all of the propaganda you see from the United Nations, from the European Union, and especially from Palestinian, um, uh, Palestinian jihadists, people like Hamas, uh, groups like Hamas and the Palestinian Authority, Mahmoud Abbas, who wrote a thesis basically denying the Holocaust, and um, it, was, it was focused on historical revisionism and denying the Holocaust, uh, assuming that the, the reason Jews are in Israel now is simply because of the Holocaust and there's no tangible connection between the land and the nation of Israel. Um, despite all of this, you can see from the testimonies, not only of Christians, but of Jews and Arab Muslims, that Israel was basically uninhabited. It was, was not a civilization but at the time that the Jews started to return. But once they returned, Israel flourished, and it, it, became, um, it became once again the center of... Um, uh, the center of, of, of commerce, of, of, um, of research, and became a thriving nation. And it also became the center of worldwide enmity when it, when it was simply a backwater province of the Ottoman Empire. No one cared about the possession of Israel. But once the British, once World War I ended and the sick man of, of Europe, the Ottoman Empire, was ushered off the stage, it became the focal point of intense hatred, and the reason uh, the reason was because uh, the, the the Muslim Arabs realized that the Jews were were finally going to return to their homeland. So, despite the fact that they themselves thrived, and th tens of thousands of Arabs actually came and settled in Israel after the Jewish Aliyah, the the the, the, the three major aliyahs that, retur that returned Jews to this land, despite the fact that there were only Arab Muslims there because of the Jews, they decided that they wanted to exterminate them. And the, this book is, is also fascinating because it goes into the modern history, how this, this ancient history ties into the modern history. And, and the thread here is the Islamic exhortation to to drive out the infidels to take land that belonged at one time at any time to Islam and reclaim that land for the sake of Islam this is the, one of the reasons you have jihadist sites things like Al Andalus they want to reconquer Spain they want to reconquer they, they want to um, reclaim Turkey as an Islamic state and uh, do away with any vestiges of secularism because they believe that all of these lands, because they were once Muslim, they are permanently Muslim. And it's, it's an Islamic concept called Dar al-Harb, the house of war. There's uh, three different, different um, relationships. One is the house of war. One is Dar al-Islam, the house of Islam. These are nations that are completely Islamic and where you don't need to wage necessarily wage war against the infidel because they've been completely subjugated. And then there's a, a medium state, which is countries that are neither Islamic nor um, that weren't Islamic at one point, but that Muslims hope to become Islamic in the future. So that would be places like Europe 
or increasingly Canada and America where you have a, a burgeoning Muslim population. And Spencer, Spencer, uh, Spencer takes the Palestinian-Israeli conflict and looks at it through the prism of the, the injunction in the Quran to go and fight the infidels and cast them out. And this is something that Muslims have been trying to do with uh, Israel before the foundation of Israel when they were simply um, uh, yeshuv and, and, and settlements within Israel by Jews. They, there were pogroms against them. And Spencer, I think, looks at this perfectly lucidly. The people who claim that this is simply a conflict analogous to the conflict in Northern Ireland between nationalists um, and unionists and Republicans, where you could have a negotiated settlement, some sort of feasible solution, or or uh, the conflict uh, or the tension between, say, the Flemish and the Walloons, the French-speaking and the Dutch in Belgium, or the the English-speaking Cameroonians and the French-speaking Cameroonians, they're, they're missing the boat here because this is not some discrete conflict that can be settled by get, portioning land. If that were the case, then the the Muslim Arabs would have accepted the partition of 1947, the Jews did, and they had two-thirds of their land given away in the form of the Transjordan. They weren't even eligible to claim that land as part of Israel, even though it was technically part of the Jewish state, or should have been. And the, the Jews there, David Ben-Gurion, I think, said that he would have accepted a state the size of a postage stamp because they realized they could make the state, however small it was, and uh, the Israeli, the late Abba Ibn, the Israeli foreign minister, said, called these Auschwitz borders, which they were. The nineteen, the original Israeli state was was less than um, I think two miles wide from from side to side, and they and yet they still accepted that because they realized they could make it thrive. On the other hand, the Arabs rejected it, and uh, Spencer goes into this particularly. The, the precedent for this, which was the disastrous Camp David Accord, the fact that the Palestinians weren't forced to relinquish anything, the Arabs weren't forced to relinquish anything, whereas the Jews were forced to give away concrete land. And I think this is something that the Kushner-Trump plan tries to address, even though I, I don't have much hope for it, and Spencer admits that there isn't really a solution to this. When you have a group that... that, that it, has an exterminationist policy and one group that wants to compromise, there really isn't a solution short of perpetual fighting. But he says there are measures that can be adopted, and I happen to agree with it. So this book, The Palestinian Delusion, again, the title is uh, The Catastrophic History of the Middle East Peace Process. Uh, this was published uh, just last year, at the end of last year. And I would recommend heartily anyone who's interested in this conflict and wants a very clear-eyed perspective that they go out and purchase this book or bar or um, or borrow this book from their local library because it's it really gives you perspective and clarifies a lot of the errors that people unknowingly buy into because they haven't done the research they haven't investigated the Islamic the roots of Islam and how it pertains to this specific conflict and how it exacerbates this conflict, and they analogize it to something like the the conflict in Northern Ireland, where there really isn't a parallel there. So I would recommend uh, b going out and buying this book, The Palestinian Delusion by Robert Spencer, perhaps the, the best author on Islam we have. And uh, I'll, uh, we will see you next time on Books and Music Review. Thank you.